Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. G'day folks and welcome to episode 55 of the podcast. Now this will be the second last episode of the year and it has been a lot of fun getting to this point. But before we begin into the life, service and legacy of Edward Atfield, I do have a couple of shout outs. Firstly to Brittany's partner who recognized me by my voice and public and introduced themselves to me. Once again, a huge thank you for listening to and supporting the podcast. And also I want to do a special shout out to listener Michael Cave. Now, your cousin let me know what was going on, so I just wanted to wish you a safe trip, and thanks for listening to the podcast. Now, with those out of the way, here is the life, service, and legacy of Private Edward Atfield, who served in the First World War. Edward Atfield was born on the 26th of April, 1890, in South Yarra, Victoria. He was the first son and second child born to Charles and Mary Atfield, and Edward also had four half-siblings to his mother Mary, who had previously married. Affectionately known as Ned to his friends and family, the Atfield family grew up in the inner Melbourne suburb of Paran. At the outbreak of the Great War, Edward attempted several times to enlist in the Australian Imperial Force, in doing so giving up a rather profitable career as a labourer. However, as he was five foot three and a half inches tall, he was repeatedly rejected on account that he was too short to enlist, as the minimum height at the time was five foot six inches tall. But so strong was the desire to serve, he was undeterred by his stature and tried to enlist a further seven times. According to a relative, he visited the St Kilda Road barracks every day before the authorities finally relented and on the 27th of December 1914, he was accepted into the Australian Imperial Force. After a period of rigorous training at the Broadmeadows Camp in Victoria, he was assigned to the 4th Reinforcements to the 5th Infantry Battalion on the 12th of April 1915, and on the following day, he embarked for overseas service aboard the transport ship HMAT A18 Wiltshire, and was taken on strength as part of the 5th Australian Infantry Battalion on the 5th of May. He found himself amongst ranks that included senior chaplain Walter Ernest Dexter, famously known as the pinching padre of the AIF and the focus of episode 14. Three days after joining the battalion, he, along with the rest of the 2nd Brigade, which included the 5th, 6th and 7th Australian Infantry Battalions, were relocated from Anzac Cove to assist the British forces in their ill-fated attack on Krithia for returning once more to Anzac Cove. On the 26th of May, Atfield was shot in the left hand and back, and was evacuated to the hospital ship Dunluch Castle, the same hospital ship that delivered Matron Grace Wilson to Mudros, for transport back to Alexandria. He arrived on the 31st when he was admitted to the 17th General Hospital. His wounds were minor, and after a month of dedicated medical care, he was transferred to the Glimmin Paulo Convalescent Hospital in Alexandria on the 3rd of June. He was discharged to the base depot at Mustafa on the 28th. Five days later, Atfield was on a troop ship bound once more for the Dardanelles, and on the 9th of July, he once again stood shoulder to shoulder with his brothers in the 5th Battalion, preparing for the impending August offensive. After the initial landings, the Dardanelles campaign started to resemble the Western Front. Well, well, if the Western Front had been conducted on the side of a mountain. On the 25th of April, the Australian and New Zealand forces of Anzac, or the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, had been ordered to go ashore north of Yabba Tepe on the Aegean coast and advance across the peninsula to cut off Ottoman forces in Kilibathe near Kanakale to stop reinforcements being sent to Cape Helles to counter the British and French landings that were making their way up the peninsula. These operations were conducted with the intent of taking out the forts alongside the European side of the Dardanelles to allow the Entente fleet to force the straits they mentioned in my episode on Lieutenant Commander Henry Hugh Stoker and the loss of HMAS AE2. Despite the morale boosts of the silent Anzac presenting as it ran amok amongst the CMMRA, the Ottoman forces quickly gained the advantage and counterattacked in early May. From that point on, neither side was actually able to dislodge the other and static trench warfare commenced. The British forces had attempted to dislodge the Ottoman garrison from Krithia in June, which actually had been an initial objective on the 25th of April. But after the third attempt failed to take the village, Sir Ian Hamilton, commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force and overall commander of the Gallipoli campaign, decided to switch tracks and planned a new offensive to break out from the Anzac perimeter and secure the Sari Bear Ridge and take positions at Baby 700 and Chunuk Bear. 
This attack would be supported by a fresh landing at Suvla Bay attacking from the northwest and by Australian troops attacking the Neck to take Baby 700, coinciding with New Zealand forces attacking Chunuk Bear with additional Australian forces attacking Lone Pine in support. For Atfield and the rest of the 5th Battalion, their involvement in the August Offensive would be the only successful component of it, which was the capture of Lone Pine, which was fought between the 6th and 10th of August. Because of the military's push on for naming things the most obvious way possible, Lone Pine, as a geographical location, was named because the prominent terrain feature of the Turkish positions opposite the Australian lines was dominated by a, you guessed it, single pine tree. It was situated on 400 Plateau, named as for its height above sea level, on the eastern side of the Anzac Lines towards the south and was comparatively flat. Due to its location relative to the beachhead and the shape of the intervening ground, Lone Pine's importance lay in the fact that its position provided a commanding view of the Australian and New Zealand rear area. The objectives of the Australian forces were to take and hold Ottoman lines and to draw the reserves away from the attack on Surrey Bear. At 5.30pm on the 6th of August, with the sun at their backs casting long shadows, the first wave of Australian troops from the 1st Brigade threw themselves at Ottoman positions, while the 2nd and 3rd Infantry and the 2nd Light Horse Brigade laid down suppressive fire. When the 1st Brigade reached the Ottoman lines, they discovered the, why the area was dominated by a single pine tree. The opposing front line had actually been covered and roofed in pine tree logs that had actually been missed by the various reconnaissance flights leading up to the attack. Undeterred, some Australians improvised, hacking into the logs with bayonets, dropping bombs into the gaps, or even jumping blindly feet first into the trenches. Most, however, charged into the communication trenches behind the front line and attacked them from the rear. Within minutes, the first Ottoman positions were taken and outposts had been established within the communications trenches. What followed was three days and nights of bloody fighting. While Australian engineers had been able to bridge the Ottoman and Australian lines to allow reinforcements, including the 5th Battalion, to cross no man's land without drawing fire, Ottoman forces were repeatedly thrown at Lone Pine to try and dislodge them, which was the intent of the attack. The dimly lit trenches became a stage for chaotic, often hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The toll was staggering. Accounts tell the dead and dying lying three and four deep in some places. As one soldier noted, quote, the best thing we could do was not step on their faces, unquote. Despite the chaos, the Australians emerged victorious at Lone Pine. Regrettably, it still does a singular success in the broader context of the August Offensive, which was marred by failures and setbacks. The cost, however, was high, with some 2,300 men killed or wounded across all six Australian battalions involved, and over 6,000 Turks suffering the same fate. Yet, from this crucible, seven Australians were bestowed with the Victoria Cross, the highest award for gallantry in the British system of awards. It remains, to this day, the highest number of Victoria Crosses issued to a single action to four Australians. Eventually, a stalemate occurred around Lone Pine as the rest of the August offensive ground to a sudden halt, and Allied forces would make no further progress until they evacuated in December. Three weeks after returning to the 5th Battalion, however, Atfield would fall victim to the blight dysentery. Brought on by the deplorable sanitation conditions on Gallipoli and the lack of potable water for proper hygiene, some 600 Australian soldiers would succumb to the infectious disease during their time on Gallipoli. On the 2nd of August, he would embark aboard the hospital ship Galica, bound once more for Alexandria, arriving on the 7th. By the 18th, however, he had sufficiently recovered to allow him to be discharged from hospital, and after training and recovery, he was transferred to the HMAT Barter on the 18th of October to return to the Dardanelles, where he would stay until Anzac forces were evacuated between the 15th and 20th of December, 1915. The evacuation marked the end of a gruelling chapter in Australia's history with approximately 80,000 Allied troops, including Atfield, leaving the peninsula. But as they departed, they left behind the silent testimony of 8,000 Australians, buried under wooden crosses and wattle seeds, a poignant legacy crafted by Chaplain Dexter. Though fortunately, the evacuation of Anzac forces occurred without a single casualty. The same could not be said when the British and French evacuated later in the week. Upon arrival in Alexandria, Atfield was marched into the overseas base Gezria on the 6th of January 1916. At the end of the month, he cashed his back pay, penned a letter to his mother, and then went on leave. On the 26th of March, the 5th Australian Infantry Battalion sailed for France in the Western Front. Private Edward Atfield, however, would not join them. On the 6th of February 1916, Atfield's service record reports him as not rejoined 5th Battalion, and he was declared absent without leave. Australia, interestingly, had the highest rate of soldiers being absent without leave amongst the Allied powers during the First World War. Despite this, they refused to execute any member of the Australian Imperial Force for desertion. This policy was shaped by the execution of Breaker Morant by British forces in the Boer War and focused in Season 1. 
To add further confusion to Atfield's disappearance is despite his battalion reporting to Cairo that he was absent without leave, his service record reported him as boarding the transport Ballarat bound for France. A case of clerical oversight that would cause headaches going forward. By the end of 1916, his family had heard nothing from him since that original letter back in January. The silence had become deafening. As a result, Atfield's parents, Charles and Mary, had contacted the Red Cross Information Bureau via John Beachman Kittle, who was in charge of the Melbourne branch, to reach out to their agents in Egypt to try and find any information about the whereabouts of their son. Due to the confusion on his service record, the response they received from the Red Cross stated, quote, As far as ascertained, at present he is well with his unit in France, unquote, and advised them if they had any concerns about his well-being to contact them again. This was interestingly not the same response given when others made inquiries about Atfield's well-being on the 18th of December 1916. The Secretary of the British Red Cross Society, Australian branch, made a separate inquiry to the CEO of the 5th Battalion in regards to Atfield, stating, quote, His friends in Melbourne have cabled us, stating that he was alleged to have been killed and asking us to make inquiries, unquote. On 29th of April 1916, Lieutenant Colonel John Walstab, Officer Commanding 5th Battalion, replied, quote, this soldier was evacuated wounded from Gallipoli on the 30th of June 1915 and has not since rejoined the unit, unquote. Further communication to the family in early 1917 to the Red Cross would reiterate that he was alive and well in France, though the wording would become less and less optimistic as the correspondence continued. His half-brother, Private James Tyler, had enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force on the 24th of January 1916, and when he himself was not in the stockade for going absent without leave amongst a slew of other offences, had been urged by his family to investigate what had happened to Ned. While I don't like to speculate on matters like this, part of me wonders if he was going absent with that leave to look for his half-brother. His brother-in-law, Edwin Kettle, also enlisted the assistance of his father and uncle, who were both in Europe, to question any members of the 5th Battalion they encountered with no success. In August 1917, the Australian Imperial Headquarters in London formally declared Edward Atfield as missing. On the 25th of January 1919, Charles Atfield died. His death notice still listed Edward Atfield as, quote, on active service, unquote, despite no word being heard from him in nearly three years. It was a poignant reminder of the persistent hope despite the silence. Three months later, the family received a notice from the army to inform them that a board of inquiry had been convened in Cairo on the 27th of February, 1919, and their finding was that he was a deserter. The news rocked the family still mourning the loss of the patriarch, Charles, now having to endure the stigma of desertion. Official confirmation came on the 21st of July 1920 when Henry Atfield was discharged from the Australian Imperial Force as a consequence of being illegally absent, leading to the forfeiture of any medals and his mother being unable to apply for a pension. His name found no place on monuments or memorials, and while not banned from attending Anzac Day commemorations, the branding of a deserter was enough to dissuade his family from attending for over a century as they fell out of place. Now, if you're wondering, this episode isn't exactly going like normal episodes, you'd be correct, and this is why. On the 4th of December 1926, Percy Russell, a solicitor in Melbourne, cabled the army base records, requesting a grant of probate of the will of Edward Atfield on account that he had not been heard from in seven years, and was presumed by his family of having passed away. While the presumption was correct... It was also seven years late. On the 31st of January, 1916, a court of inquiry had been held in the 1st Australian Divisional Base Depot of Giza to identify an unidentified Australian soldier that had been allegedly murdered by way of strangulation between the 27th and 28th of January, 1916. At the time, the court reported that, quote, no evidence has been brought before the court that would assist in any way in identifying the deceased, unquote. In 1923, with the only absentee Australian soldier in the vicinity of the overseas base Gizreya during 1916 being Edward Atfield, the military officials suggested the connection on his record that, quote, there appears to be a possibility of his being identical to this unknown Australian soldier, unquote. Unfortunately, when this board was conveyed in 1923, the surviving members of the burial party were interviewed by the board and shown a photo of Atfield, one shared by his parents. They could not make a positive identification between that photo and a man had buried seven years earlier in the old Cairo Cemetery. The matter, as far as the military was concerned at the time, was resolved. Atfield was a deserter, but the family clung on to the belief otherwise. It would take 100 years and the National Archives of Australia digitising the service records of Australian service personnel from the Great War before any further progress would be made. 
Victorian amateur military researcher Martin Elgett, who had been researching his own family history when he joined the website The Great War Forum, where he became an active member in the group who was researching those who had served in either the First or Second World Wars, who were for some reason not included in the Commonwealth War Graves Roll of Honor and thus didn't receive a proper War Graves headstone. In his own words, what had started as a hobby had become an obsession, when in October 2014, he stumbled upon the probate index entry made by Percy Russell in regards to Edward Atfield and posted his query to the Great War Forum, seeking more information. In February 2015, he wrote to the then Minister for Defence and the Unrecovered War Casualties Team Army and the Office of the Australian War Graves with the evidence that he uncovered from Atfield's family and his own service record. The authorities at the time then understandably informed him that they would need to conduct their own investigation. Now, we jump ahead three more years, and by his own words, quote, Out of the blue, on the 14th of December 2017, I received exciting news. The National Politics Reporter with the Herald Sun called and advised there had been a development in the Atfield case and asked if I would share my research so he could write an article about it, unquote. The manager of Unrecovered War Casualties Army informed Elegant that his team had, after extensive investigation of the facts, had determined that in all likelihood, the unidentified Australian soldier buried in the old Cairo Cemetery was indeed Edward Atfield. At the time of his alleged murder, Private Edward Atfield would have been 24 years old. Now I can hear you, but with current genetic testing, surely we should be able to positively identify the unidentified Australian soldier and confirm it as Atfield. Like we did with Abel Seaman Wellesby Clark, the formerly unknown Australian sailor and focus of episode 42, considering that the family were actively engaged in this investigation. And to that, I have to refer you back to last episode and the story of the unknown Australian soldier. One of the obstacles Australian authorities had to overcome to inter the unknown Australian soldier in the Hall of Memory at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra was the Commonwealth War Graves Commission's strict policy on exhumations, including that, quote, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and its member governments follow the principle that the war dead should, as far as possible, be allowed to rest in peace and not be disturbed. Therefore, the Commission does not permit exhumations from the graves of Commonwealth war casualties for the purposes of identification. This includes opening graves to extract DNA samples, unquote. And for the record, Abel Seaman Wellesby Clark falls under a special provision that allowed DNA testing because technically his recovery in 2006 was the first time it had been recovered since the end of the war, thus it wasn't an official war grave. Prior to Anzac Day 2018, the then Minister for Defence Personnel and Veterans Affairs, Mr. Darren Chester, confirmed that Private Edward Atfield had been previously incorrectly recorded as an illegal absentee, and had in fact been strangled, and his unidentified body buried in the old Cairo War Cemetery. On Anzac Day 2018, under the watchful eye of then Commander Matthew Keogh, Royal Australian Navy, now the current Minister for Veterans Affairs of Australia, at the Anzac Day commemorations of the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, where Atfield's closest living relative, Beverly Warren, resided, Atfield's family were officially awarded his 1914-15 star, British War Medal, Victory Medal, and Anzac Commemorative Medallion. She was also presented with Atfield's official death certificate. At a ceremony at the Old Cairo War Cemetery, the headstone that had previously bore the inscription, Here Lies an Unknown Australian Soldier from the War of 1914-1918, a new headstone was unveiled, bearing the inscription, Believed to be 1701 Private E. Atfield, 5th Battalion, Australian Infantry, 27 to 28 January, 1916, age 24. He resides under the epitaph chosen by his family, quote, Beloved son of Mary and Charles, I once was lost, but now am found, unquote. He is also commemorated on Supplementary Panel 1 of the First World War Roll of Honor at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And there you have it, folks. That is the life, service, and legacy of Private Edward Atfield. You were lost for over a century, but now you've been found and your name cleared. Although you were laid to rest within the embrace of Egyptian sands, I do hope you find some measure of peace once more in the land that you loved. And no, you will never be forgotten. Works cited in this episode are the biographical pages of Edward Atfield and James Tyler from the AIF Project of the University of New South Wales, the article, An Unknown Australian Soldier, identified as a true hero of Gallipoli over 100 years later from Newsbreezer. The official statement from the Honourable Darren Chester, MP, on the Unknown Australian Soldier, identified 101 years after death from the 21st of April 2018. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission War Casualty Entry on Private Edward Atfield. The article, Digger's Identity and Reputation Restored from the Department of Defence. The Virtual War Memorial of Australian Biography Entry on Edward Ned Atfield. 
Brian Hartigan's article, 1916, Deserters Named Cleared, Body Identified, from Contact Magazine. Hannah Henderson's articles, Researcher Clears Name of Long Lost Gallipoli Hero Who Was Listed as a Deserter, from the New Daily. And Unknown Australian Soldier Identified as True Hero of Gallipoli More Than 100 Years Later, from the Australian Broadcast Corporation's news website. Ancient shoot of the Sisters of Mercy of Australia and Papua New Guinea's newsletter, Mercy Matters, Anzac Day 2018. The article, Mystery of Australian Soldier Gone Missing in Egypt, revealed after 100 years from the Enterprise Press. The Trove Online Newspaper Archive from the National Library of Australia. Private Edward Atfield, 5th Battalion AIF, missing in Cairo. Was he murdered? Forum Post Series from the Great War, 1914-1918 Forum. Stephen Taylor's article, Deserter Cleared with Full Military Honours from MP News. And the service record of Private Edward Atfield from the National Archives of Australia and the Red Cross Missing and Injured Persons Report on Private Edward Atfield. I was only doing my job, an Australian military history podcast is made possible thanks to the generous support from each and every one of you, but in particular, our Armoured Emu Brigade community. Now, if you want to join in on the conversation, you can do so over on our social media channels. At this point, the podcast is on everything. And if you want to join the Armoured Emu Brigade community, you can do so over on our Discord server. Links to everything are on our website as well as in the episode description. But if you want to support the podcast, you now have two options. You can either buy the podcast a one-off coffee or join us on Patreon for ongoing support. Each cent given goes directly into digitization of records as well as distribution and licensing. We seem to have hit a chord with the population of Ashburn, Virginia, as it and the United States are still our most popular country in the, to listen to the podcast. So a shout out to whoever is following us there. Now, if you enjoy this or any other episode in the series, please leave a review or share it with a friend as it is the best way to get the show in the ears of people who need to hear it. Until next time, friends, catch you then. Bye. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support this podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.